Good evening, everyone. And we would like to welcome you to our, our daily revision towards the 2021 Ghana School of Law in Francis of Nation. Uh, as we promised that uh, we will be pushing this daily until the night before your examination, we say prayers for you that you go in the cell. Yes, we have our regular night meeting at the at 9 p.m., uh, which we'll do to continue the discussion of land law we started the last night. But uh, because the things are many, and at this stage, no one is quite certain regarding uh, where the questions or the challenge is going to come from. It is just prudent that we pay attention to all the six examinable models, giving them equal attention and making sure that we have reasonable mastery of all the topics uh, so that uh, whichever way that they decide to engage us will not be uh, caught off guard. And this afternoon, uh, we are privileged to have uh, a colleague of mine uh, that I'll be doing this uh, sacrificial uh, uh, work for good of students uh, since uh, last year, uh, COVID era. Uh, so this year too, we are blessed to have you here with us. Uh, earlier on, I talked to special prosecutor and my good friend and the classmate, uh, William Kusia Jabin, uh, who has also agreed to come into the class uh, in the course of the week. So when uh, his, his, his schedule permits him to do that, I will certainly uh, set up a class. Even if it will not be like the regular night and it will be uh, one of these uh, spontaneous classes like we are doing now, because this is really spontaneous. But the good thing is that uh, a good uh, number of you have committed the rest of your time to those uh, revisions. So, regardless of the shortness of the notice, you are still able to come uh, online. So we are very happy that uh, we have a reasonable number despite the uh, lack of a prior notice. And because of the YouTube channel that uh, we, and we try to upload the recordings uh, of lectures to, those who through no fault of this are going to mix this uh, great opportunity of speaking of hearing our great uh, colleague, they will still be able to play it back. So without uh, wasting time, uh, may I uh, have the pleasure of respectfully inviting uh, Miss uh, Gertrude Ama, uh, a very seasoned uh, lawyer and a lecturer with the UPSC. And she's also a practicing colleague in our Accra office at East Ligon. So, Lawyer Gertrude, you are very much welcome to our virtual class uh, revision for those preparing to write the 2021 Ghana School of Law and Transformation. You are welcome, Lawyer Gertrude. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yeah. Pleasure. So, we are yeah. going into the era of uh, Ghana legal system and legal method uh, this afternoon. And uh, Lawyer Gertrude will be leading us to discuss. Uh, to revise, I wouldn't say discuss because as I, I tell you, the philosophy of this uh, engagement is that you have already uh, done the learning. So our uh, effort is to help you to revise that which you are supposed to know already, but maybe becoming a bit rusty because of the passage of time. So without wasting time, uh, we'll get to uh, Here are your students and we are happy to listen to you. Yes, thank you so much, Doc, and uh, good evening to everyone. Indeed, I'm, I'm very happy to be here for a number of reasons. Um, primarily because I'm not a stranger to this session. It's only unfortunate that this year I haven't had the opportunity of joining in any of the revision classes. But I've, I've had all of you in my, in my mind and in my heart and in my prayers, most importantly. Um, I, I know and I understand, I can relate to the kind of things you are likely to be feeling at this point, the kind of feelings you are having. But I can assure you that with the kind of preparation that you are engaged in, and with the guidance of people like Dr. Owusu Dapa 
and some of your other lecturers, I'm very confident that you'll be able to, um, you know, cross this hurdle and cross it successfully. And you would all find your way to the Ghana School of Law. So thank you, Doc, for having me. And I think it's also a good opportunity for me to thank you, uh, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of all the other students for this sacrifice that you have been making over the years, that um, in your own small way, you have been assisting them. Despite your very tight schedule, you still manage to find time within that very tight schedule to assist our good friends in their revision. So God bless you. I, I know I'm expressing the sentiment of every other uh, student in the class. So God bless you and thank you so much for this sacrifice that you are making for all of us. Yes, so guys, um, I'm happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here. It's even difficult to express to you how happy I am to see uh, and certain familiar names as well. I'm already seeing some of the names that I'm so familiar with and others that I may not be so familiar with. But the most important thing is that um, we are here and we are committed towards our, our revision and our preparation for the law school entrance exams. Um, I hope that everything has been going on well. I hope that you are all taking one day at a time because really that's essentially the only thing you can do. There's no need to panic. There's no need to panic. There's no need to be anxious. Really, this is not something that is impossible. It is, it is possible for you to do it. And I have always maintained that the most important thing is for you to have that confidence in yourself and for you to also believe in yourself and for you to prepare adequately towards it because it's really not enough to have confidence in yourself and believe in yourself if you are not putting in the kind of hard work that is necessary to be able to um, prevail. So just to assure all of you that we have you in our hearts, we have you in our prayers, and we are very confident that with the kind of commitment you are putting in your preparation, uh, you will all make it. So with that being said, maybe we can jump straight into our revision. Once again, it's, it's definitely not going to be the one-sided kind of uh, spoon feeding method that we may have been used to in the past. With engagements such as these, it's a revision. So it's important that we all contribute, we all share ideas, because these are things we have learned in school already. Yes, it's true we may have done these things in the, in the past three, four years, but it doesn't change the fact that we have already learned them, and this is merely a way of revising. So I would have wished that we could have an interactive session. Um, but at the same time, it has to be organized. So maybe as and when I need certain views or certain opinions to be shared by the class, you can simply just raise your hand and then uh, Dr. Dapa or any other co-host that we have can ask for your contributions. So yes, please uh, get ready. Let us have a very interactive session. I hope that you all have copies of your 1992 constitution of Ghana with you, and then maybe some other relevant materials that uh, we, might, we might have to look at. And especially in this case, the Interpretation Act 2009, Act 792, I'll be happy if at a minimum, you have copies of um, the Interpretation Act and the 1992 Republican constitution uh, with you. I, I want us to briefly look at something in legal method or legal methods. The, the law of interpretation. You don't agree with me that the subject Ghana legal system and legal methods is very fundamental. And that is why for every law student, immediately you enter the LLB program. One of the courses that you must of necessity take or study is the legal system of Ghana, as well as the more practical aspect of our legal system, which is taught in the course legal method. And I, I so enjoy teaching and learning this course for a number of reasons. The most important one is the fact that it introduces us to very basic, very foundational matters that we should be familiar with as students of law. So there's no way you should you know, go out somewhere and say that you're an LLB student, and yes, we are unable to explain certain basic and fundamental concepts and principles which ordinarily you would have learned in a course like Ghana Legal System and Legal Method. You should be familiar with the legal system in which you are studying the law. You should be familiar with the laws of this country. You should be familiar with the institutions that administer those laws. And at the same time, you should be familiar with the personnel who are in charge of the administration of those laws. 
Other things that you should be familiar with, particularly under the course legal method issues like the law of interpretation, uh, judicial precedent, maybe a little bit and pieces of civil procedure, criminal procedure, alternative dispute resolution, and so on and so forth. But for today, I want us to see how best we can use the next uh, 25, 30, 40 minutes to have a brief discussion on the law of interpretation, on the law of interpretation. Um, I find this subject very exciting because it is something that practitioners of the law are always engaged in, primarily members of the bench. So you would agree with me that whenever there's a legal issue, for which reason we have to go to court, many a times the legal issue would revolve around the meaning to be given to some text. And one we want to find out, why do we even need to interpret? Why do we even need to give meaning to a particular text or a particular word? So the meaning is there. I mean, if everybody knows the meaning of the word uh, shall be deemed, or everybody knows the meaning of, of that phrase, or everybody knows the meaning of the word is on the phrase, unable to perform his functions, and so on and so forth. Why do we then need to embark on a journey of interpretation? But the, the answer to me lies in the reason why you are all reading the law. It's not as simplistic as that, because many a times parties involved in litigation have their own meanings that they would want to ascribe to a particular text. And definitely those meanings would contrast. So whereas one party may want to say that to me, this is the meaning that should be given to word A, party B would say, no, I think differently. So at the end of the day, we need to resort to a court of law able to interpret and of course we all know that final judicial power resides in the judiciary and for which reason they'll be able to give us a final uh, and binding determination as to the meaning that should be given to that phrase so maybe we can begin by asking ourselves what do we mean by interpretation when you hear the word interpretation especially in the context of law what comes to your mind so when someone says that, oh, lawyer, I want you to uh, take me to the Supreme Court to seek uh, interpretation of this constitutional provision or of that constitutional provision, or I want to go to the High Court to seek uh, interpretation of a particular statutory provision, what is that? What, what, what is essentially is that person trying to say? Doc, please, is it possible for, I don't know how the, yes. the discussion has been going, but is it possible for us to get views? Oh, sure, 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 sure. That's ab absolutely. And I usually prefer uh, 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 that kind of engagement. And no wonder I call these sessions uh, interactive sessions. Interactive session in the sense that uh, it's better to hear the students. Sometimes the, some of the responses may contain some uh, errors and then we're able to correct that. Okay. Uh, yeah, rather than they just keep quiet. So okay. it's better to you know, hear them. And I, I think- So that, in that case, how are we able to, uh, do we have them raise their hands if someone has a view? Or uh, yes, 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 absolutely. Like uh, if someone yes, okay. wants to contribute, the person can uh, read right. uh, his, his or uh, yes. Yes, thank you so much. So guys, there, there's a question on the floor, not really a question, but a request to share ideas that uh, in the context of law, when you hear the word interpretation, what comes to your mind? Maybe you can even just give us the ordinary, the dictionary, the grammatical meaning of that word interpretation before uh, we move on. Okay, so I see what, uh, Madam Dede, if yeah, Dede you can, can. Yeah, you can allow her. On mute, oh right, I think yeah, I'm a yeah, co-host now. Let, yeah. Okay, good evening. Yeah. Um, to me, interpretation means like determining the, intended meaning of the written law. Okay, okay. In determining the intended, I mean, I wish I had a, a black or a blackboard black or a board white board. board. No, but that's fine. That's, that's just a, <laughs> on the lighter side. I like, I like the, the view that the day has just shared with us. Determining the intended, I mean, that word is, is of cardinal importance. The intended meaning of a given law. But the day uh, you realize that sometimes it's not always uh, a law. We don't always need to find the meaning of a law. It might be some other document, it's not necessarily a law, but that doesn't mean that you are, you are right. You are totally spot on. 
Okay, maybe I can also hear from uh, Bright. Bright also had his hand up. Yes. Mr. Jesse, right, your hand was up. Other than that, let's just go to Ellen. Ellen's hand was up. Okay. Yes, Ellen, unmute. You have to unmute yourself first. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll say for me, interpretation is like seeking an, an understanding into a text that is either not clear or the meaning is ambiguous. All right, great, very good. I think I like that as well. So you see, instead of the word a law, Ellen broadens it by saying what a text, which I think is, is more preferable because like I expressed earlier, we don't, it is not always, interpretation is not always with regard to finding the meaning of a law. It could be any text at all. And very soon we'll look at the categories of text that are most likely uh, to be interpreted. Yes, yeah, so I agree with all of you, wonderful contributions. Simply, when we talk of interpretation, we are looking at finding meaning out of a text and mainly doing so for the purpose of being able to apply it to a given set of facts. Many a times we want to interpret so that we can apply the meaning that we get from that exercise of interpretation to a given set of facts. We could also simply say that interpretation could mean what taking steps to explain the meaning of a text or even a journey of trying to find the purport of words used in a text. You remember that they was initially talking about the intended meaning, the purported meaning. And very soon we'll come to find out why we qualify meaning by intended or purported. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, so far, so far, so good. Very interesting uh you know views from you guys well done but then the question becomes why do we need to find meaning out of a text why can't we i mean what, what are the circumstances that would necessitate that we look out for the meaning of a particular text um i think one of you have already uh given us a hint into the kind of answers that i'm looking for but maybe we can go into it a little bit more great abigail has a hand up so Abigail, we are asking, why do we even have to interpret? Why do we need to embark on a journey of finding the meaning of a text? Why is interpretation necessary? Yes, go on. Please. Yes, I'm back. You, you uh, have to unmute yourself, Abigail. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yes. Hello, good evening. Good evening, madam. Madam Gatchi, thank you for being here. I'm so happy to see you. Yes, me too. Okay. So um, I believe that there is some of the reasons why we need to interpret text is because of the changes of words over time. Um, yes, basically some of the um, words and then the meanings that we believe we know change over time and some of them have some technicalities and ambiguities mm -hmm. and them okay. there, so... All right. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes, I think I agree with you that sometimes the meaning of a word, you, I mean, we all know that uh, as a matter of practicality, sometimes the meaning of words changed. The meaning of words can be dynamic. So the meaning that we want to ascribe to a word in a particular situation or in a particular circumstance may not be the same meaning that it should be given in a different circumstance. Or even there are times when the meaning, the known meaning of a word from the past assumes a broader meaning, a more expansive meaning, for which reason we may have to give what a totally different meaning to that particular uh, text. Yes, thank you so much for that. Any other? Uh, any, any? Okay, I have my black dictionary here. Okay. If I'm also permitted Your black law dictionary, yeah, which is great. Let's hear from the black law dictionary. If I'm permitted to, to come in, uh, lawyer, get to. Please, definitely. Okay. I wish they would allow me to write this and the examination. How I feel for the student, but it's not possible. <laughs> okay, so uh, I may come in according to the uh, Black's uh, Law uh, Dictionary. Uh, this is the meaning of uh, the word interpretation. I'm using, uh, I have the ninth edition here in the chambers. And then I have the ninth edition at my study room. So let me, ninth edition, page eight, 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 nine, four. The interpretation. The process of determining what something, especially the law or legal document means. 
the ascertainment of meaning to be given to words or other manifestation of intentions. So that is uh, what the Brass uh, Law Dictionary says. And then uh, with respect to contracts, and you say the interpretation as applied to written law is the act or process of discovering and expanding the intended signification of the language use. That is the meaning which the authors of the law design it to convey to others. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Doc. And I think this exercise is very important. Um, what you just did by referring to the Black's Law Dictionary, which one uh, well, maybe could qualify as a secondary uh, source of law. We need to be able to detail, I mean, to develop that kind of habit that when you come across a word which you are unsure of, one of the first places that you can resort to is, is a law dictionary, a, a known one, a credible one. So thank you for uh, that, that referral, Doc. And I think uh, the meaning given from the Blacks out of the Blacks Law Dictionary is not totally different from what we have, uh, we have tried to say by way of our own individual views. So I think we are not very too far from, from what the situation actually is. Yes, yeah, so we were looking at the reason why we even need to interpret in the first place. One of the things I remember one of you say is the fact that sometimes the, the context within which a word finds itself would require meaning, a different meaning being given to that word, which I agree with. Sometimes you also realize that there may be the presence of certain ambiguities and inconsistencies created by the words used in the text. When we talk of ambiguity, what do we mean? When a word lends itself to more than one meaning. So depending on the usage of a word, it can take on a meaning that is multiple. And when that happens, parties may be at loggerheads over which of the various meanings should be resorted to mainly because the word is ambiguous. So do we resort to meaning A or meaning B? So that is actually one of the reasons why we may want to interpret a word used in a text. Sometimes to inconsistencies. The word used in a particular text can lead to inconsistencies in the meaning of that text. And to, in order for us to be able to clear those inconsistencies, we may need to embark upon this journey of interpretation. Yes, Mame, you want to say something? Let me just hold for a minute and then I'll allow you to go on. Please, okay, you are, I think you are muted, Mame, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just trying to add, uh, add up to what you are just saying. Um, as in, in the case of the public versus special tribunal, I've seen that somebody has put it in the chat. That is um, Esparte Bedu Akosa. The court um, was actually trying to establish at what point should the lower court refer a matter to the Supreme Court for an interpretation to be done? And then it actually gave four grounds on which an interpretation could be sought. The mm -hmm. first one is um, when the language used in the constitution is ambiguous. Mami, mommy, you know what? I would want you to put a hold on that right there and remind me later on in this discussion when I mentioned constitutional interpretation, and then I'm going, in fact, let me note your name down. That when I get to constitutional uh, interpretation, I'm going to call upon Mami to share this very view with us. So I want you to hold on uh, for, for that for now. And then um, the reason is that I just want us to look at the, the, the general, you know, reasons which may necessitate interpretation. What we are saying is spot on. You are 100% correct. But the, the, the ratio in that case, was specific to an aspect of interpretation known as constitutional interpretation, which will be coming to very soon. So I just want us to hold on right there. When we come there, guys, remind us that Mami, Mami will take the lead on that discussion. Yes, yeah, so um, to clear ambiguities, you know, to create, sorry, to, to clear inconsistencies that may have been created in, in, in the text or by the usage of a word in a particular text. Sometimes even to clear some conditions of doubt that have been created by the words used in a text and so on and so forth. There are so many reasons why uh, we, can, we can resort to interpretation. Even we can also resort to interpretation to correct instances of error on the part of the draftman. You know, the draftman or the draft woman who puts laws together, they are human beings just like you and I. 
And being a human enterprise, it is always possible for errors to be made in drafting, in the drafting of laws. Sometimes when these errors are made by the draftman, the only way that we can have them corrected is by resorting to the courts for an interpretation of the meaning to be placed on those words. And we can see the case of the Republic versus High Court Accra, ex parte a day, for an instance where it was necessary for the court to resort to interpretation in correcting an error made by the draftsman. We'll come to this very soon when we get to statutory interpretation. So we can just uh, put a hold on that for, for now. Now, I want us to um, look at something. What, what is the legal basis of interpretation? In other words, what, which, which law gives the backing for courts to embark on this journey of interpretation? Upon what authority do judges, do courts embark on interpretation? And I think this is something that I'd want to hear from you guys on, specifically in relation to some constitutional provisions which I'm hoping to come to your mind by now. So the question once again is, what is the legal basis of interpretation? by any court. We can, for example, just limit ourselves to the Supreme Court for now or even to any other courts. Which, 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 where do courts get the authority, the legal backing to be able to engage in interpretation? What, what do you guys think? Uh, Some of the names here I know already. So if, if you don't volunteer yourself, I can also easily uh, volunteer you. Doctor, uh, you wanted one, to say something? One, one Cecilia has, one Cecilia, are okay, you in I the chat? From here. In the chat, I stated at 130. But uh, maybe if I'm permitted to also come in, uh, well, since I, I, I like learning, I'm always learning and revising. <laughs> so if I may take part. Definitely. Uh, yeah, maybe to start with, I would say that the power to interpret legislation or to interpret a document or to interpret uh, anything uh, put together, first and foremost is inherent in the power of adjudication. It's inherent in the power of the court to do it works, do it work as a court. So I think that is the first one. But then there may be issue as to uh, what they call the authoritative pronouncement. Since there are various uh, courts, right, of varying importance within the core structure or the hierarchy of courts, uh, then it becomes necessary for us to have uh, some kind of uh, like the, the ranking. And that is where, when it comes to interpretation of the 1992 constitution, being the supreme law or the, the most important law uh, per Article 11 uh, and the Article 1 and 2, uh, the, the Supreme Court, uh, as per Article 130, is giving the jurisdiction so that when it comes to uh, interpretation, especially of the Constitution, once the Supreme Court has said okay, that yeah. this is the meaning, and uh, that will be it. But of course, for other form of interpretation, other documents, other statutes, and all that, and in uh, every court, as part of its judicial power to make adjudication has that uh, inherent power. Uh, so the power to interpret is very well embedded, embedded in the, 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 the jurisdiction of that court, uh, generally speaking. So that is my humble uh, take. Yes, your very humble and precise, precise take. Guys, I think this is a very important distinction, distinction Doc is drawing and which many at times um, students do not take cognizance of, but it's important that we understand. So from what Dr. Dapa just said, generally, generally, the power to give meaning to a text is, is inherent in the adjudicatory powers of every court. But of course, there are special or exclusive or unique powers that have been given to a, a court, for example, like the Supreme Court, to engage in a particular kind of interpretation. 
And of course, in that case, that means that once that power has been given exclusively to this court that we are talking of, that is the Supreme Court, and it means that all other courts would not be able to engage in that exercise of what interpreting the constitution. So generally, when it comes to giving the meaning of a text in any text, aside the constitution, so maybe a deed, a document, a statute, what have you, generally, every court has the inherent power to do so. But like we'll soon see under the provisions of Article 130 plus 1 of the 1992 Constitution, when it comes to a particular type of interpretation, that is the exclusive preserve of the, the, the Supreme Court. Can we have someone read Article 130 plus 1 of the 1992 Constitution for us, please? If you have it, just unmute yourself and read. I'm also opening to mine. Oh, please read, uh, Daniel. Article 131. No, 131. Yeah, so 130 plus 1. Yeah, that's what I said. Article 131. Oh, okay. I thought I had 131. Oh, sorry. OK, so subject to the jurisdiction of the High Court in the enforcement of the fundamental human rights and freedoms as provided in Article 33 of this Constitution. The Supreme Court shall have exclusive original jurisdiction in A, all matters relating to the enforcement or interpretation of this constitution. And B, all matters arising as to whether an enactment was made in excess of the powers conferred on parliament or any other authority or person by law under or under this constitution. All right. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, we are still looking at some nearly introductory matters, so I wouldn't want us to go too much into this. But you have just seen from what Daniel read in Article 130 plus 1, that it is only the Supreme Court that has the exclusive original jurisdiction to determine all matters relating to the interpretation of the Constitution. So what that simply means is that if there should arise some, you know, some legal issue or some question concerning the meaning to be given to a particular word or a particular phrase in the constitution. That is not a matter that you can take to, uh, for example, the high court or any other lower court, but rather this is the exclusive preserve of the Supreme Court. Now very soon we'll look at the conditions under which this jurisdiction of the Supreme Court would be uh, invoked or the circumstances under which we can seek an interpretation of a provision of the constitution, but I want us to go in a more, uh, a more structured form. So just by way of revising, what we have been doing so far is to look at the meaning of the word interpretation. Secondly, we have also tried to look at why there's the need for us to even interpret. Why do we even have to interpret? So to clear conditions of doubt, ambiguity, inconsistencies, uh, to clear or to correct errors made by the draftsman and so on and so forth. Then we have also tried to find out what the legal basis of interpretation is. And we have learned that all courts generally have the inherent power to give meaning to a word used in a text or even in a statute. However, when it comes to constitutional interpretation, that is the exclusive preserve of the Supreme Court. Now, these are some of the tiny things that is so easy to get students with. Imagine you get a set of facts that alludes to the fact that there, there has, you know, there, there's, there's some misunderstanding or there's some disagreement as to the meaning to be given to a word in a particular statute. So one of the parties wants to seek an interpretation of the word used in that statute. For many of you, if you don't understand the fact that generally statutory interpretation is something that can be undertaken by any court, depending on the circumstances, you might just want to rush and say, oh, this one, let's just, uh, the person must go to the Supreme Court, forgetting that it is in cases of constitutional interpretation that the Supreme Court has what, the exclusive original jurisdiction to, 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 to determine. Right. Good. Um, yes, Doc. Yes. Uh, I, I I think uh, I was a bit uh, uh, asked them if it was article 132 read by Daniel as well. No. Okay. So maybe uh, if I may fill in with that, and I also want to sure. talk on the case of a republic versus my Kankan, right? Uh, yeah. 
So if you look at Article 130, uh, Clause 2 of the 1992 Constitution, it says, and I quote, where an issue that relates to a matter or question in Clause 1, that is the interpretation in, of this article arises in any proceedings in the court other than the Supreme Court, that court shall stay the proceedings and refer the question of law involved to the Supreme Court for determination and the court in which the question arose shall dispose of the case in accordance with the decision of the Supreme Court, uh, unquote. So uh, this particular provision uh, requires that if there is a, a case before any court other than the Supreme Court and someone decides to raise an issue that there is uh, a constitutional uh, uh, interpretation. Now, Article 130, Clause 2, uh, ordinarily requires that the particular court in which the issue has been, uh, has been raised should actually uh, put the proceedings uh, on hold and make a referral to the Supreme Court that we have to call it the case stated like frame the constitutional uh, question for the Supreme Court to uh, answer it. And after the Supreme Court has actually uh, answered it by providing an interpretation, it will be referred back to that court to continue with the hearing and adjudication of that case according to the particular uh, meaning uh, which the court, uh, the Supreme Court gave to that constitutional issue. And it is in that context that the case of the uh, Republic versus the uh, Haikankan, uh, which is an old case, 1971 case, but uh, there was a similar provision under the 1969 constitution, which is in par material with uh, Article 130, Clause 2 of the current 1992 constitution. So in Republic versus Makankan, uh, Chief Justice Bannerman, uh, Republic was in my Kankan, the Republic was in my Kankan 1971, two Ghana Law Report 473. Uh, Chief uh, Dr. made the statement, and I quote, lower court is not bound to refer to the Supreme Court every submission alleging as an issue of uh, the determination of question of interpretation of the Constitution or of any other matter containing Article 106, 1 and A or B, which is equivalent to Article 130. If in the opinion of the lower courts, the answer to a submission is clear and unambiguous. On the face of the provision of the constitution or laws of Ghana, no reference need be made since no question of interpretation arises. And a person who disagrees with or is aggrieved by the ruling of the court, of the lower court, has his remedy by normal way of appeal if he so uh, chooses. So, uh, what it simply means is that it doesn't mean that anytime uh, somebody, maybe a, a, a case is before district court, high court or whatever, and somebody will say that uh, this is unconstitutional, then the judge must ordinarily stop proceedings or put it on hold and refer it to the Supreme Court. No, that where the judge uh, is of the view that the matter which has been raised on the face of it is so clear that there is no interpretive uh, issue. The judge is entitled to go ahead and apply what he thinks the position of the law is. And then if you are a party and are grieved by it, you can have your remedy by uh, appealing. And so in the recent case of Espartis Zinato, right? Espartis Zinato, the Supreme Court uh, actually uh, reinforced the, 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 the interpretation uh, which had been given in the case of the Republic versus Mahankan. Uh, that yes, Article 130 Clause 2 ordinarily requires that uh, where an issue of interpretation uh, arises before a court other than Supreme Court, referral should be made to the Supreme Court for determination to that. Effect. Nevertheless, where in the opinion of the judge before whom the, 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 the interpretive issue has raised, for example, is not really one uh, which is ambiguous, which really call for interpretation. The judge can ignore it and go ahead and determine the case. And the, if the other party disagrees, when there's an appeal later on, 
he can appeal that or something like that. Yeah, so thank you and sorry for the interruption. Yes, thank you, Doc. I think um, someone has his hand up. Daniel, Daniel may have a question or a contribution. You can unmute yourself and see. Un unmute yourself. Okay, Doc. Um, so I want to know, with the two authorities you gave, it, it is so clear. I read the case as well. But when I read the case, I had this issue. I was thinking, if they are saying that the interpretation of the Constitution is a preserve of the Supreme Court, won't the High Court be assuming the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court by trying to put his own interpretation on the West to see if it is actually clear or not? Because if two different lawyers think um, the meaning of a particular text or a phrase is ambiguous one way or the other. They are both putting different interpretations on it. The judge, the high court judge, thinking that it is so clear and will go ahead whatever trial or proceedings, won't it be assuming that that particular high court be assuming the exclusive jurisdiction of the, the, the Supreme Court? Okay. Uh, uh, lawyer, get through. Can I uh, attempt to respond to Daniel? Sure, sure, definitely. <laughs> All right, okay, thank you. So, uh, Daniel, I think that uh, the, the, the wisdom behind the, the, the principle, which was enunciated in Republic versus Mike Kankan and has been reaffirmed in a number of Supreme Court cases, including the recent uh, S Party's uh, decision especially in the opinion of the uh, now the chief justice uh, Anin Yeboah. As it seems to be that, uh, uh, don't, because if you are not careful, the Supreme Court to be, what do you call the floodgate arguments, the Supreme Court to be inundated with multiplicity of you no know, flimsy uh, constitutional interpretation issues. So, I think the principle is serving some kind of like, a, a, if you like, a, a gate a keeping a, a rule, or it's like a filter, a filter. And that is why the, the, they said that, yes, the judge before whom the, an issue has been made that something is constitutional or unconstitutional will have to make like the preliminary uh, determination on his own. If he or she, for example, thinks that is is really uh, raises uh, uh, interpretive uh, constitutional issue before he will stay proceedings and make reference to the Supreme Court. And I think it's good because just imagine over uh, 500 uh, various levels of courts around the country, maybe more than that. Every now and again, every and, and uh, thousands of cases before the court. And uh, you can get clever lawyers who can decide to turn almost everything into constitutional issue. And every case will have to be stalled since the judge will have to comply with Article 130, Clause 2, if you took a very simplistic view of it. And that is why there is much wisdom in the, the, the principle in Republic versus Maikankan, reinforced in various cases, including as part of NATO. So uh, I think that, uh, that, that, that is something good. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Doc. Thank you, Doc. I think I, I agree, especially, I mean, I agree with everything that you have said, because clearly there has to be a genuine need for constitutional interpretation. There has to be a real need. But if it's some flimsy, uh, you know, reason or the other, then clearly the Supreme Court would end up being inundated with all sort of questions which may not in substance, the actual constitutional questions, or which may not be questions that would require interpretation of the constitution. So definitely there's a lot of uh, wisdom behind it. Um, yes, I think there's another hand, Francis. Yes, unmute, you have to unmute yourself first. Uh, I think we have to unmute them, so, okay. Oh, go. really, okay. Okay, um, my question is, uh, in fact, I was even going to ask um, that question before Prof um, brought in um, Esparte Zanata. When I was reading Esparte Zanata, I don't know if I read it wrong, but I, I, I had the impression that my, was that the Supreme Court actually granted the order of the jury uh, to quite the decision of the High Court for failing to refer the issue to the Supreme Court. Um, I don't know if 
um, I, I, I had it wrong or um, there's something I need to take notice of. So that, that, that's the one thing that I want to, no, I want to find out. But, but you see, uh, the fact that there was a question does not mean that there has been a departure uh, or there has been overruling of the principle in uh, Republic versus uh, my Kankan. Uh, and, and of course, and you know, that's is any boss uh, decision is a, is a dissenting opinion. I don't know if you read uh, uh, that as well, but I think that in both the majority and the minority uh, decision is not uh, strictly speaking saying that uh, the, the position in uh, Republic versus Mankankan, for example, is no longer a good law. No, it's still a good law. Uh, just that in the, uh, so for example, let me quote, I'm just, I have the decision in front of me and I'll put it on some of the platforms that some of you are on. So if you look at the Justice uh, Tukuba, uh, who gave the majority uh, decision, for example, uh, Justice Tukuba somewhere in the decision uh, had this to say, and I quote, uh, it is clearly an error of law to regard Article 94.1a in the manner the trial judge did. Clearly, an issue of interpretation had arisen concerning Article 94.1, and a trial judge should have state proceedings and refer that issue to discourse under Article 132 of the, of the Constitution uh, for determination by of interpretation. Pay attention. It has to be realized that the initial instance of the uh, Supreme Court, uh, exemplified by cases of Republic versus Mike Kankan, Esparti Akosa, Adumwa, the second against Aduchum, uh, which laid uh, emphasis on the plain meaning of a statute, the new era of constitutional interpretation based on the non dominant principle of purposive construction of a statute, particularly the constitution. So in the beginning, the Republic against the High Court, as party electoral commission, the tide against ready referral for interpretation began to change. In that case, apparently, very clear and unambiguous constitutional provisions were held to be referable ambiguities. Thus, in Republic against High Court, as party uh, commission on human, ad human rights, human administrative uh, justice and uh, this court held that the word complaint in Article 218A of the Constitution was ambiguous and was referred to this court of interpretation. Indeed, in that case, the court held that a lower court ought not readily to assume that a constitutional provision is plain and unambiguous. This trend of thought has been followed in Republic versus uh, High Court, Accra, S Party, Attorney General, uh, 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 Balkan Energy, Ghana, interested. So, okay, the, the majority opinion is saying that uh, the scope of Republic versus uh, Mikankan uh, should be uh, narrowed, but it did not say that Republic versus Mikankan is actually uh, departed from. And I think that if you pay attention to the minority decision, that the dissenting decision of uh, the uh, justice and in Yeboa, as he then was, who is now the supreme, who is now the chief justice, uh, it uh, reinforces uh, the uh, position. So, for example, if we look at justice uh, and in Yeboa's decision, uh, this is what he says: "Quote, on my part, I find no ambiguity in this constitutional provision, which can say for the applicant edges falsely that." the Lenin High Court judge interpreted and thereby usurp the exclusive jurisdiction of this court. This issue has been settled by the authority since 1969 constitution, which had very similar provision on jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in matters of interpretation of the constitution. A Republic versus Mike Kankan, Banaman CJ said as follows, and I've quoted that for you already. If in the opinion of the lower court, the answer to a submission is clear and unambiguous in the face of the provision of the constitution, or the laws of Ghana, no reference need be made since no question of interpretation arises. And a person who disagreed with or is aggrieved by the ruling of the lower court has his remedy 
by normal way of appeal, if he so chooses. To interpret provision of Article 106 of the Constitution in any other way may entail and encourage reference to the Supreme Court of frivolous, frivolous submissions, some of which may be intended to stultify proceedings or the due process of law and may lead to delay, such as may in fact amount to denial of justice. Then uh, he made a uh, reference to so many other cases. And then uh, Chief Justice uh, uh, Aqua, sorry, Chief, uh, the, uh, Justice Janine Yeboah will make uh, the point uh, that uh, where the meaning is so plain and all that, then uh, there is no need uh, for a stay uh, to be made. Yeah, so I think that uh, uh, despite the fact that the, the, the majority appear to have uh, watered down, or let me say to narrow the scope of the principle of Republic versus my Kankan, it has not completely departed from that or it has not uh, repealed that uh, as, a, uh, as a bad law, no. Yeah, I mean, that's my... Uh, um, okay, so to, for me to get it um, right, um, the, the, the case in S versus Danato essentially um, distinguished the fact as it were from my Kanka because um, yeah. um, the sorry, majority decision sorry. was that once two lawyers have put forth plausible um, the, the definition of what they think the text means, then it means that it's an issue of interpretation, at least in S versus Danato. So what the court actually did is was to distinguish the the majority decision, um, of course. Yes. What to distinguish? Yes. Yeah, but, okay. but what I want, uh, just before uh, I get to that, just uh, keep quiet, will be that uh, what I want us to uh, remember is the, the policy rationale underpinning the principle in Republic versus my Kankan is a very important uh, 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 principle. And as I said, God against and and any boy JSC as he then was was uh, got it uh, uh, right on point that the problem with my kind kind seems to avoid frivolous uh, constitutional submission because like you can go to any court get any average uh, smart lawyer you can turn every issue into constitutional uh, issue and then you begin to uh, bombard that particular court that. Uh, this this is what the constitution means, or that is what it means, and all that, and put unnecessary uh, burden or pressure on the trial judge to put the proceedings on hold and make a uh, referral to Supreme Court. And in fact, if you take lawyers who are uh, defending the defendants or the accused persons, and that would be a very uh, veritable uh, uh, defense in your uh, arsenal just to think hard and see if you can formulate a constitutional issue. And since it will put pressure for referral to be, and then when the referral uh, is go to Supreme Court, it takes a while before the Supreme Court will actually decide that it may not even come anytime soon. And the, the entire case, if you like, will have been certified uh, uh, unjustifiably. And that, I think, is the reason behind the principle in the Republic versus my Kankan, yes. Because in any case, if you think that you had a genuine constitutional issue. What prevented you from invoking the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, right? And, and go uh, uh, straight there. Yes, yeah, so I like, get you. I'm done, please continue. Yes, yeah, so um, Doc, please check your private message when you, you have the chance. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that that is um, quite clear. And um, before I, I move on, I think there's a caution Aira. that we- Wow, Winim. Yeah, some more. I've just had to mute the He didn't know he was on me. <laughs> um, there's a question that I think we all need to bear in mind, especially when it comes to the study of the law of interpretation. And that would, bear, that would lead me into making uh, my next point. It is quite a broad and a vast subject area, which is underpinned by certain basic principles. The point I'm simply trying to make is that when we are studying this subject, it's important that we go in a logical manner because interpretation has so many aspects. So understand the basic things that are required of you as a student of law 
and how we should understand this topic of the law of interpretation. And then on that basis, we can delve into the, the more finer details. Now that leads me to the next point that I'm about to make. How do we interpret? Do we just on the basis of our whims and caprices? And in this case, I'm talking about the courts or judges. You know, just say that, okay, uh, looking at the facts before me, I think this is the meaning that should be placed before, that should be placed on a particular text for which interpretation is being sought. Or do we just look at the faces of the lawyers and say, okay, well, looking at your face, I think this is the meaning that should be placed on a particular text. No, we need to know and we need to understand that interpretation is not an arbitrary act. It is not something that is done on the basis of one's whims and caprices or on the basis of one's own personal wishes. There are laid down rules which have been developed over the years through case law and which have uh, you know, uh, uh, led to what we have come to refer to as basic rules of interpretation. So what we are simply saying is that interpretation is not something that we just get up and do. There are laid down rules that must be followed when we are embarking on this journey of interpretation. And these laid down rules are rules that have been developed for so many years through case law, and they have come to be crystallized or calcified, if you want, into what we have now come to refer to as what? The basic rules of interpretation. So as a student of the law of interpretation, Aside knowing what interpretation is and why we interpret, you must also know the basic rules of interpretation. Those rules that we must follow whenever we are embarking on this journey of interpretation or whenever we are trying to find the meaning of a word as used in a text or even in a law. So when we talk of basic rules of interpretation, we are simply looking at the rules or the steps, the, the principles that must be followed in arriving at the meaning of a text. Now, I think we should also know that the basic rules of interpretation differ on the basis of the kind of text that we are interpreting. So there are basic rules of interpretation for different kinds of text. Remember we said in our introductory comments that instead of saying that we only do interpretation for law, we can make that broader and say that interpretation is done for text. When you say text, then it means that laws, statutes, constitutions, what have you, would also find themselves within that word text. So depending on the kind of text that we are seeking to interpret, there are basic rules that must be followed. Then of course, that would lead us to our next question, that what are the kind of text that can be interpreted? One, it is possible to interpret what we call deeds and documents. Two, we can also interpret statutes, what we refer to as statutory interpretation. And number three, we can also interpret what? National constitutions, what we refer to as constitutional interpretation. What I'm simply saying is that there are different categories of text that we can interpret. And each category comes with its own basic rules of interpretation. Now, the main, the three main categories of text that we can always allude to in the law of interpretation are one, deeds and documents. Number two, statutes. And then number three, national constitutions. So the point is that there are basic rules of interpretation for each of these classes of text. So you can find me asking you in an exam, what are the basic rules of interpretation for deeds and documents? And very soon we'll come and look at what we mean by deeds and documents. So things like contracts, uh, wills, and so on and so forth. Those would all come under deeds and documents. And those are things which can equally be interpreted. So there are basic rules of interpretation for deeds and documents, which you must know. There are basic rules of interpretation for statutes, what we call statutory interpretation, the basic rules for statutory interpretation. And we also have the basic rules for what? Interpretation of constitutions or what we refer to as constitutional interpretation. Now it makes it easier for you as a student of law when you look at the rules of interpretation in this context on the basis of the various type of text that we can interpret. Other than that, if you fail to do so, the rules become a, 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 a whole jumble in your mind. And you hear things like, oh, the percussive approach, 
you hear the uh, literal approach and you're wondering, ah, which one is this, which one is that? But if you have it in mind that we have basic rules for the interpretation of these and documents, basic rules for the interpretation of statutes and that for the interpretation of constitutions, it makes life much, much easier. Doc, are you there, please? Uh, yes. Great. Doc, have you cited my private message? Uh, <laughs> let me check. Yeah, go ahead. Let, let me check. Yes. So, um, good. So maybe we can begin by looking at the basic rules for the interpretation of deeds and documents. Then one might want to find out what do we mean by the word deed? What, what is a deed? When we talk of a deed, uh, you've all done the law of contract. What, what, what is the meaning of the word deed? Can we have any uh, ideas in that regard? Yes, uh, Mike, Michael, Sumaila. Oh, his hand is not up. Okay. Anyway, uh, maybe if we don't have any views in that regard, we can we can move on. Although I know that you all know what we mean by. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So I see there are some views in the chat. Documents that are written and signed. A deed is a, a, a written uh, document and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, that's true. So I would want to look at the common law meaning of a deed. So at, at common law, you can say that a deed may be defined as a special document, which must be in writing, which is signed, uh, which is sealed, and is also delivered by the parties with a view to conferring an interest, a right or a property, or even creating some binding obligations on the parties. So a document which is intended to have a contractual effect. You can also look at the meaning given in the Hillsbury's laws, laws of, of, of England. So what are some examples of deeds? Things like uh, wills, uh, promissory notes, a contract, even a contract for the sale of goods. Those are all things that can give rise to interpretation. There can be what you might consider as a simple contract between two or more parties. But however, at some point in time, there could be some misunderstanding as to the meaning, meaning that should be placed in certain words in that contract. So when we talk of deeds, this is essentially what we mean by deeds. Then the question becomes, when we have to interpret deeds, what are the rules that we have to follow? So there's a contract before you as a judge. There's a will before you as a judge. There's a promissory note before you as a judge. Are you going to apply the rules of constitutional interpretation in your interpretation of a deed or a document? Or are you going to apply the rules of statutory interpretation in your interpretation of a will or even a contract? The answer to that is simply no. So there are rules for the interpretation, basic rules for the interpretation of deeds and documents, which we must know. Now, um, it's highly unfortunate, but I'm, I will have to leave, take leave of you at this point. Because I have a Zoom meeting, an emergency, which has uh, an emergency meeting, which started at exactly six o'clock. So I'm actually eight minutes late. But it's likely I'll join you again before the, the meeting ends. So I'll leave you in the capable hands of Dr. Owusu Dapa while I look forward to joining uh, you guys uh, maybe in the next one hour. I'm hoping that you'll be here by then. Okay, Doctor, uh, please forgive me, but uh, this has been necessitated by circumstances beyond my control. So, so should I continue your lecture? <laughs> that, that is entirely up to you, Doc. <laughs> uh, okay, let me see if I can share. Uh, wait, wait, which slide did you get to? Uh oh, I was just looking at the basic rules for the interpretation of deeds and documents. So I think slide 13. Uh, let me check. Just a minute if I can. Uh, so we're just looking at the the basic rules or the rules that we need to follow when we are interpreting a deed yeah Exactly, and the, uh, the dictator of the Court of Appeal in Baini and Baini, great. Uh, is, is that it? Yes, it is. Um, 
Okay, right. Thank you very much, uh, lawyer Gertrude, for uh, being with us. We appreciate the time that we spent uh, with us. Uh, lawyer Gertrude asked what a deed was, and I don't know whether you were not allowed to speak, but I did not see any hand uh, raised. Now, in law of contracts, you remember that uh, we talk about the contract by deed or contract under seal. And uh, over there, we are told that uh, a deed is a, a very special document, is a solemn uh, document, and the party's uh, seal is supposed to be put upon it. And historically, the seal was a, a very important mark of authenticity so that if your seal is found on a document, what that meant was that the, you have given a very uh, high uh, credence, high believability to that document. And people who are dealing with you can just rely upon what the document is saying uh, without more. So that is a deed. And that being uh, the case, uh, when it comes to interpretation of the deed, trying to decipher the meaning or the import of what is contained in the deed. Okay, I've seen uh, one smiler is trying to speak. Uh, yeah, smiler. Uh, yes, smiler, go ahead. Smiler, uh, you can, yes, go ahead. Sir, so, is this my understanding of the case uh, involving Martin Pebu and Attorney General? Ah. Concerning the concerning the um, the enforcement of the domestic um, uh, domestic uh, the, concerning the enforcement of an act of parliament, and the issue that arose was respect to the interpretation. All right. So, uh, by if you don't mind, let's be systematic. So, uh, let's finish with the deeds and documents. When it comes to uh, statutory interpretation, then uh, we can take that so that. Uh, All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Smiler. Yes. So, uh, with respect to interpretation of uh, deed, and as I said, a uh, deed uh, refers to all. Uh, we talk this and, do and other documents. So that is it. So when it comes to interpretation of that, the Court of Appeal propounded a very useful guide in the well-known case of a binding and binding. And uh, the principles are that the construction, the construction must be as near to the mind and intention of the author as the law will permit. And then the intention must be gathered from the written instrument itself. Technical ways of limitation will have their strategic effect. And this is not new to us. Even if we take uh, something like a uh, contractual document, you've met interpretation of a, a, a document where we are discussing the exclusion clauses and all that. So fundamentally, what the court is saying is that it is the intention of the parties, what the parties actually want to convey, which is important. And what the parties want to convey is embedded in the writing. It's embedded in the document. So you don't look at outside the document to know uh, what the intention of the uh, parties are. And that is why the court of appeal was saying that the interpretation of a deed and document must be as near to the mind and intention of the author as the law permits. And, and, and for this purpose, and that is why uh, uh, I get to make the point that uh, you must have your interpretation uh, acts uh, uh, just around you when you are doing interpretation because uh, certain ways are giving uh, certain meanings. And where you are doing interpretation and the interpretation, especially when it comes to subject interpretation and the, interpret the, the document you're interpreting has not given uh, maybe some specialized meaning, then it is those meanings, those uh, presumptions which are contained in the law, which govern interpretation, which will be relied upon by the court in attempt to unravel, to uncover the intention of the parties as contained in the document. 
And that is why the third rule says that technical ways of limitation will have their strict uh, legal effects. And, and, and that is uh, very important. And of course, uh, you remember the contract of rental room with respect to interpretation of, let's say, exclusion clause and things uh, like that. Uh, that will be uh, uh, an example of what they are referring to by the third principle. And if you look at the uh, Dr. Bimpombito Blessed Memory, and it's a very respected uh, book, The Law of Interpretation uh, in Ghana, he also had uh, the fourth rule that if you are interpreting a document, you must uh, read the document as a whole. Reading the document as a whole simply means that you don't just look at a clause. You don't just look at the sentence uh, in the document and just arrive at your, your, your interpretation or make a conclusion. You must see the entire document before you as one whole. And whatever meaning you are trying to put upon any particular word or upon any clause or sentence should sit well with the rest of the document. And it should effectuate the entire purpose, the entire intention of the parties as it were. And that is why uh, he said that the document must be read as a whole in order to arrive at the true intention of the, of, of the party. So that is uh, quite uh, pertinent. So maybe let's say a few words about each of these uh, uh, four rules, uh, which you have seen should guide interpretation of the uh, this expanded in a binary and binary and also added on by uh, uh, Buta. So first, we made the point that the construction of a deed and other documents uh, according to Baini and Baini, and of course, and so many other authorities must be as near to the mind and intention of the maker or the author. Uh, and that is to uh, say that, yes, if you want to give the rare meaning the rare meaning and not a strained meaning and not any artificial meaning of the document. Uh, you must uh, actually uh, do that. You, and that. So if the course, for example, will find that uh, literal or grammatical meaning of the West uh, will lead to absurdity or unreasonableness or repugnancy, repugnancy or inconsistency or some internal uh, contradiction to the rest of the document, the court will have to modify the literal meaning. In other words, since the document you are interpreting is supposed to be interpreted for it to be close to the intention of the parties as possible. If you interpret a clause in one section of the document and that meaning you have arrived at is inconsistent with the rest of the document, then you have to know that the meaning that you have arrived at is not the rare meaning, is not effectuating intention of the parties. Because since the document is altered by the parties, they will not be contradicting themselves. So the literal meaning or the grammatical meaning, or that is the ordinary or the, the, the plain meaning, so to speak, uh, which you have arrived at will have to be uh, modified if it's going to lead to absurdity, it's going to lead to unreasonableness, uh, having regard to the true intention of the, of the parties. Uh, so maybe you can look at the case of the Henry, I met a few, uh, which is about like the a case on the will. I don't know if any of you have read it. You can uh, share your reading with us. I met a few, I met a few. Anybody? Now, another point in relation to uh, the interpretation uh, of a deed, uh, which we are discussing, uh, is that the, the court is to give intention, to give effect to the intention as expressed in the deed, as expressed in the document and not what was intended to have been expressed. What do you mean by that? Uh, that is to say that it is the meaning which can be gathered from the document itself and not uh, any other meaning uh, which the parties thought 
to have conveyed by the document which is being uh, interpreted. So that is uh, very important. And for that matter, the court is not supposed to uh, think for the parties and substitute presumed intention for the express intention. It is the express intention that what is stated in the document, which is very important. Uh, yes, uh, Richard, uh, Andy. Uh, what is it? Uh, oh, let me, I think there's a confusion somewhere. Uh, yes, Richard Andy. Yes, Doc, thank you. Um, on the uh, interpretation using the intention as per what is portrayed in the, in the deed, my question is if the, uh, the phrases or words used within the deeds are of uh, are having more than one meaning, how then do we interpret such uh, a phrase or word in the deed? Right. If the, um, first of all, uh, as we have noted, that the intention should be as near, the, the interpretation should be as near the mind or intention of the parties as possible. And again, we have also noted that the document should be seen as a whole. Now, what that means is that where the same word, right? The same word has been used in different places in the document. First and foremost, they will be intended to have the same meaning throughout the document, unless uh, in a particular context, the court will notice that a different meaning was intended by the parties. And that meaning, when it's actually given uh, in that particular context or session, is not going to be inconsistent with the rest of the document. It's not going to contradict the document uh, seen as a whole. Yeah, so that is how the court will go about it. But once the same word is, for example, used uh, throughout the document in different places, the general rule or the presumption is that they are intended to have the same meaning. That is a general rule, except where in a particular context of the document, if you are to uh, stick to the, the general meaning, the literal meaning, which is given to that way throughout the document is going to result in absurdity. Then uh, the court will actually arrive at a different meaning. And that meaning which will be arrived at should be consistent with the rest of the document. Yeah, so I think that is what uh, we should uh, keep in mind. Uh, Richard, I don't know if that uh, helped address some of your question. Richard Dandy is gone. Okay. We have also made the point uh, that uh, first and foremost, uh, how do you do a technical uh, uh, construction like that technical ways uh, should be given the meaning which they are supposed to signify? Yes, so the general position is that the words in the document must be given ordinary dictionary meaning. And I want us to pay attention to that. If you take this uh, respected Israeli jurist called uh, Aaron Barak, for example, he will come down to it with interpretation anywhere that, and of course, if you take uh, scholars like the hearts and so on, if you take the law, if you take any human beings, not only the law, any document, we use language, right? We use language to carry our ideas. We use language to carry our intentions. And for that matter, where we have, express ourselves in a document and we need to interpret that document. We must, uh, first of all, start from the ordinary meaning, ordinary dictionary meaning, so that how a particular word is understood in the dictionary, that is how the particular word should be uh, taken to mean. That is a starting point. That is a starting point. But uh, where the word use has acquired a technical meaning, where the word use uh, has got a meaning other than what is uh, meant 
in everyday language or everyday uh, lexicon uh, meaning, dictionary meaning, then the court will have to uh, construe the word in its uh, special or uh, technical uh, meaning. Let me give you uh, uh, example. Uh, let's say that uh, uh, what uh, what word uh, comes to. Let's say let's say like an action example. Okay, action. Uh, uh, action. Action. If you take the dictionary, action has a meaning, ordinary meaning. Yes, yeah, to to do something and all that. But in law, action has a technical meaning. It's an abbreviation of a course of action, and a course of action simply means that a factual situation for which the law give a remedy. So you cannot, for example, just take the ordinary meaning of the uh, of action and say that that is what it means because it has acquired a special or technical uh, meaning uh, as uh, it were. So that is uh, very important. Or let me give you an uh, example. Let's say that if the parties have made a document and they have stated that uh, uh, special damages, for example, will be awarded. A special damages has got a stipulative meaning in law and it is that meaning which will be given. Uh, and not uh, uh, any ordinary uh, meaning. So for example, if you tell like the, uh, the Baini and Baini, uh, there was a, a deed of settlement which had been made uh, and it contained a clause by which the said law conveyed his landed property to three persons as life tenants and thereafter to his four children as the remainder man their heirs and assigns forever. So these were the words which were used in the deed. And the court held that the words used were technical words of limitation. A man be given the technical meaning. That if you come into conveyancing, if you come into a law of uh, immovable property and all that, these words have got a settled meaning, They've got the technical meaning, and they are not ordinary meaning uh, uh, like us in everyday use of a language. And for that matter, you must give the technical uh, meaning to that. We have also noted that another principle related to interpretation of this or another document is that it must be read as a whole. It must be read as a whole. And that is very uh, important. Uh, reading the document uh, as a whole uh, is a a very genuine attempt to ascertain the intention of the maker or the author and to effectuate uh, their true intention. And this becomes uh, more uh, useful where there is an apparent mistake in the wording of the document. Maybe in one area of the document, you see uh, a mistake there and uh, you, you are at loss as what to do with that. But if you are taking the document as a whole, it will become obvious with that the, a certain mistake there was really a mistake uh, which was not intended by the parties. And for that matter, to actualize the intention of the parties, you need to give interpretation which corrects that apparent mistake. And that is uh, uh, what happened in the case of a Najat Meta Enterprise Limited against the uh, the, the, uh, Hansen. Of course, there is no uh, uh, time on your part, but I would like you to look at that case and you will uh, notice that uh, there was a dispute in terms of like the name of a company as to whether the use of the word Najat company was a mistake or it was not like the, a mistake. So, uh, Look at that, Najat uh, Meta Enterprise Limited against Hansen. And also the cause of uh, Boatin against the uh, Volta uh, Alumino. This is supposed to be like a quick revision, so we need to move uh, very fast. Now this will bring us to discussion of the principles which govern interpretation of statutes, so basic interpretation of statutes. So how do you interpret like the statutes? And uh, first of all, we have to remember that uh, at common law, uh, three main basic rules of interpretation of uh, 
statutes of statutory interpretation are crystallized. And these are first, the literal or plain meaning rule. And secondly, the golden rule. And finally, the mischief rule. So these are the three uh, basic rules of interpretation. The literal or plain meaning rule, the golden rule, and the mischief rule. So let's take them one after the other and say a few words about them. So the literal rule, by the literal rule, we are saying that you need to give effect to the intention of parties. I mean, of the, no, sorry, not parties. Uh, intention of parliament, that is the lawmaker. We are not talking about uh, documents or this, we are talking about an act of parliament or subsidiary legislation or any other uh, 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 type of law. So you need to give intention to, uh, you need to give effect to intention of parliament. What did parliament intend by making that piece of legislation? And you determine that intention uh, by giving plain or ordinary or grammatical meaning to the words used. And again, it's consistent with what Aaron Barak has told us that the lawmaker uses language which people are used to to carry out its legislative purpose or intention. So to know what the mind of parliament was in making the law, we just have to look at the, the language use and the language use, uh, the plain meaning, the grammatical meaning will tell you what parliament meant. So that is the, the, the thing that we should keep in mind. And for that matter, uh, the courts have a duty to give effect to exactly what a statute or what a parliament is saying, even if the terms or if the wording appear unpalatable, even if it appears uh, unpalatable, uh, the literal rule says that we have to give uh, effect to that. So what are the essential aspects of the literal rule of uh, statutory interpretation? Uh, first, we have to note that it is the intention of the legislature that is being sought. So that is the first thing. We want to arrive at the intention of the lawmaker. And this intention is derived from the words used in the statute that is being sought and not from other sources. It is only the words used in the statute that should help us to arrive at the intention of parliament and not any other source, not any extrinsic or extraneous uh, sources. And thirdly, by the literal rule, it is required that the words must be given their ordinary and natural sense. What the words means naturally in ordinary uh, parlance. Uh, and the court therefore is not concerned with the result of its interpretation as to whether the statute is wise is achieving a wise outcome or not. That is not the point. What is important is that the words used in the statute in ordinary acceptation, what do they mean? And that will be taken as reflective for intention of, 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 of parliament. So that is a literal rule. And then we also have like the, the golden uh, rule. The golden rule, uh, is associated with the, the locus uh, classicus, uh, Gray and Pearson, that landmark is of Gray and Pearson, especially the beautiful words of the Lord Wensley, uh, when uh, he made the point, and I quote, in construing laws and statutes and all written instruments, the grammatical and ordinary sense of the word is to be adhered to, unless that will lead to some absurdity or some repugnance or inconsistency, the rest of the instrument, in which case the grammatical and ordinary sense of the words may be modified so as to avoid absurdity and inconsistency, but no other. Now, unquote. So if you look at uh, the dictum of Lord Ronsbury, what the golden rule simply means is that Yes, we have to start from the literal meaning. However, if adherence to the literal meaning of the word will result in absurdity and reasonableness, something which defies 
reason, common sense, logic. Then we need to modify the meaning of the words. We need to modify the technical meaning uh, as it were. So that is uh, uh, what we should note. So therefore, the golden rule becomes uh, relevant when the application of the words in a statue will lead to an absurdity. So glaring, so obvious that it could not be what was intended or contemplated by the legislature. There's a presumption that the legislature does not, in, does not intend a reasonableness, does not intend absurdity, does not intend uh, repugnance or, or, or obnoxious meaning. So that if adhering to the ordinary meaning of the word will result in something which is so absurd that that could not have been what is intended or contemplated by the lawmaker, you need to uh, modify that in order to uh, avoid that absurd result. And that is the essence of the golden rule of uh, interpretation. And this will bring us to the third uh, basic uh, rule of interpretation the mischief rule, also known as the rule in the hidden case, uh, the rule in the hidden case or the mischief rule. And the uh, point or the essence of the, the mischief rule is to draw attention of the court to the reasons or purpose behind the legislation. In other words, uh, by the mischief rule or the rule in the hidden case, the court is to recognize that the legislation it is interpreting did not happen out of the blue. It was precipitated by certain things. It is as a result of certain development or certain problem. And that should guide the interpretation. So therefore, in the Hayden's case, the court, Depended four things which will guide interpretation of statutes. First, the court must find out what was the common law before the making of the act. In other words, what was the case law position regarding that subject matter before this legislation was made? And two, what was the mischief and the defects for which the common law did not provide? So let's say that if you are using the, the, the contract act, the at 25 as illustration, and let's say that uh, there's an issue as to interpretation of section 8.1, uh, which says that, where I don't have my contract act, but just to paraphrase it, section 8.1 at 25 says that, uh, where there's a promise to keep an offer open for a certain period of time, the promisor or the offeror is bound by that promise, uh, whether or not uh, consideration has been provided by the promisee. So that is what the provision says. So let's suppose that uh, an issue arises regarding the meaning of that provision, that section 8 one. Going by the mischief rule, Right, going by the mischief rule or the rule in the Hildens case that first you have to know what the common law was before the making of the act. So what was the common law position before the making of uh, the contract act, especially section 8.1? The position was uh, what we had in the cases like Dickinson and Doss, Woodledge and Grant, that uh, where an offeror has promised to keep an offer open. Uh, if you don't provide a uh, consideration, the offeror can uh, revoke or withdraw the offer and things like that. So that was a common law before the making of this uh, provision. Now, the second aspect of the, 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 the rules in the hidden case is that what was the mischief and the defect for which the common law did not provide? In other words, what was the problem what was the problem with, the, with that particular area of the law, uh, which the common law was lacking or was wanting or did not provide 
uh, solution. What was that, that? So you need to find out what the problem was. And then uh, the third rule, what remedy has parliament resolved and appointed to cure the disease? Aware of the inadequacy which existed in the common law, the problem which existed regarding that particular uh, uh, matter. Now, with respect to the legislation before the court now, what solution, what remedy? did parliament intend to provide to resolve or to cure the problem, which we have diagnosed as existing in the common law prior to the making of this legislation. And then you go on to the fourth rule, the true reason of the remedy, the solution that parliament has provided, what is like the, the true reason for that? What is like the overall objective uh, as it were? So, by the mischief rule, the judges are supposed to construe or interpret the statute or the act in a way which will suppress the mischief and advance the remedy proposed by the, the, the lawmaker. The interpretation should seek to avoid or tone down the problem which preceded the making of the law and rather advance or further the solution uh, which was uh, uh, adopted to address that uh, problem. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, of course, uh, the principle uh, which uh, uh, as is, I mean, uh, Dr. Buta stated that you should interpret uh, the DC documents as a whole also applies to interpreting like the statute. You have to take the statute as a whole, and then uh, you don't just stand on one session, one uh, provision, and ignore the rest of it. And you make sure that the interpretation which is being given would actually uh, advance the intention of the lawmaker uh, as it were. Now, having become aware of these uh, basic rules of interpretation, uh, it is important uh, for us to also remember that uh, the judges usually resort to what we call the aids to interpretation and presumptions. Uh, aids to interpretations and uh, presumption. When we say aids to interpretation and uh, presumption, we are talking about the fact that there are certain things which will help the judges in trying to interpret, trying to arrive at the intention of the parties or arrive at the intention of the makers of a document. And for example, I just give you uh, just an example of some of the A's of uh, interpretation. So we have what you call like the, the internal A's and external A's, but when you are in the uh, uh, law school, you will learn some of this. And so, for example, the, the title, if you are talking, you take legislation, the title of the legislation is an aid of interpretation. You have like the short title, the long title, and then the various arrangements, and then the session uh, headings and all that, as well as even the, the punctuations and all those things. They are all is to interpret it is to interpretation and also the interpretation session. Yesterday in the in the in the, in the land law uh, revision, I urge you to read the interpretation session of the Land Act uh, 2020 at 1036. Now I refer you to this session 181 or so as the interpretation session. And that is if you like the, the dictionary of that uh, legislation. And all those things uh, aid the court in trying to interpret the the law. And of course, the presumption and all that, they also include the directive principle of state policy. If we take the 1992 constitution, apart from the chapter five on parliamentary human rights and freedoms, we have chapter six of the called the directive principles of state policy. Now the directive principles of uh, state policy as was stated in the Luther case by the Supreme Court, 
per themselves are not meant to be decisionable, are not meant to be enforceable on their own. The exception being that where by the nature of that directive principle of state policy, you can find another provision in the constitution relevant to that, then uh, that particular directive principle, uh, directive uh, principle of state policy is justiciable or is uh, enforceable uh, as it were. Quite apart from direct enforcement, the directive principle of state policy, according to plethora of authorities, uh, you know, by the Supreme Court, and also by even uh, the, the, the wording of the constitution itself, uh, is meant to serve as a, as a guide. It's, it's, it's meant to help the court to interpret uh, the constitution and also to interpret uh, law. So if you look at Article 34 of the constitution, which is the beginning of the directive principle of state policy, uh, it says, and I quote, uh, cross one, the directive principles of state policy contained in this chapter shall guide all citizens, parliament, the president, the judiciary, so the judiciary, that is the courts, uh, council of state, cabinet, political party, and other bodies and persons in applying or interpreting the constitution and any other law, so pay attention, and any other law, so that includes all other statutes and implementing any public, uh, any sorry, any policy decision for the establishment of a just uh, and free society. So the import of Article 34 is that the directive uh, 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 principles of state policy are meant to serve as an important interpretive guide to the courts in interpreting the constitution and interpreting other laws uh, of the land. So that is uh, very uh, important. And quite apart from the directive principle of state policy, we have to remember that the constitution is the supreme or fundamental law of the land. And for that matter, in applying the basic rules of interpretation, we don't have to arrive at an interpretation which, for example, will be inconsistent with the constitution of Ghana. So the constitution itself becomes a very important uh, uh, rule on interpretation whatever interpretation you are going to give to anything, whether the other you know, laws as, as of parliament or even uh, these and other documents and all that must actually be consistent with the constitution as we know. And that is the sense of the, the supremacy uh, rule. If you look at the, uh, uh, you know, the article one and uh, article two, of the constitution, especially that the one, the supremacy rule, is the, the highest law. And of course, let me retreat the advice that I've, I, I've given you about three weeks ago that uh, to help you not to be swerved by your examiners concerning any question for which you need knowledge of constitutional law, especially the constitution, I will suggest that every day, we try to read at least 10 articles of the constitution between now and when you write the exams. If you can even make it uh, 15 or 20 articles, that would be good. And yes, I also told you to be reading at least 15 sessions of the new Land Act, Act uh, 1036 every day so that you will become very conversant with uh, what the new position of the law is uh, as it were. So let's uh, keep that uh, in mind. Um, yeah, another thing that we should uh, keep in mind, uh, I've talked about the fact that uh, the court also uh, make use of uh, A's to uh, interpretation. And when we talk about the A's to interpretation, uh, they are talking about like, the, the common law, uh, or the statutory principles, uh, 
or, or rules of interpretation applied by the courts as guide to determine the legislative uh, intent. So there are various things uh, which constitute uh, aid to interpretation. But before we talk about them, it is very useful to remember the wisdom of Lord Reed in Mansell and Orleans that uh, the, the A's to interpretation are servant, not uh, masters. They are handmaids and they are not uh, masters. Meaning that if by resorting to an A to interpretation is going to result in absurdity or unreasonableness, then uh, they have to be avoided. So the aids to interpretation may be categorized broadly into statutory aids to interpretation, uh, which are also uh, subdivided into extrinsic aid or external aid to interpretation, then intrinsic aid or internal aids to interpretation. And of course, we also have like the common law uh, uh, principles to interpretation. So let us uh, quickly uh, say a few words about each of them. And I think that in about 20, 30 minutes time, we should be doing this particular uh, lecture. Uh, so A's to interpretation, the external aid or the extrinsic uh, A's to interpretation. Uh, external meaning that they are found outside the test of what is being interpreted. They are outside the test of what is being interpreted. And these are legislative, uh, parliamentary history, directive principle of state policy, textbook, academic publications, and practice. So if you are interpreting any uh, legislation or any test, you may need to be guided by materials which are outside what you are interpreting. Of course, when I mention uh, the parliamentary history. I hope you remember the old case of Pepe and Hats. Uh, remember that uh, uh, before uh, Pepe and Hats, the position of the law has been that you could not look at uh, all those uh, parliamentary materials and commissions report and all that. But of course, Pepe and Hats came to change that. And also, if you look at our own uh, interpretation act. It has actually made it clear that you can have a recourse to parliamentary uh, history, recourse to commissions of uh, inquiry report, uh, which preceded the enactment of a particular uh, provision and uh, adapt things. And of course, most importantly, the directive principle of state policy is something which must always be, uh, uh, which must be kept in mind. Because the constitution says that it should guide uh, the judiciary and all other organs and functionaries uh, of state as it were. So you can look at the uh, session 10 of the Interpretation uh, Act, as I have indicated, and it reinforces uh, this particular point. What about internal uh, aids to interpretation? Internal aids or intrinsic aid to interpretation. And I would like you to look at the session 13, 14, 15, and session 42 of the Interpretation Act 2009, Act uh, 792. And uh, you'll notice that, as I told you, like the long title. When we say long title, you know, if you take legislation, legislation has got the two titles. How do you call it the short title, right? So for example, let me see if I have my plan act here. I think the last few days I have fallen in love with the with the, the land, the new land act. I don't know if I carry it in my laptop bag. Let me just see if it's here. Uh, I think I, you know, I think I left it, uh, left it at home. Let it my study room is not here, but the uh, like just wanted to give you like illustration that every so like the land act that is like the short title, 
And then the long title is what is underneath, underneath it. An act to consolidate, harmonize, and so on and so forth. That's what you call like the long title. And that is supposed to be, if you like, a, a very uh, cryptic uh, statement of the purpose of that law. So the long title is supposed to give you uh, the purpose of that particular legislation, as it were. And some legislation may also have preamble, although this is, is not common in our jurisdiction. It is a constitution which has got like a preamble. And all those things serve as uh, internal aid in helping to arrive at the intention of parliament or the lawmaker. And of course, punctuation. Punctuations too are very useful internal aid because if we take comma, right? We know uh, what comma means. Comma means that you are listening, full stop. You know, you have like the, the dash or the half in, and then you have like the semicolon and the colon. Right, all those things are meant to convey meaning. They are meant to convey meaning and they help us to uh, determine the input or the meaning of uh, a piece of a legislation or a particular provision as it were. And of course, the schedule, the schedule is, or the schedule is also supposed to serve as an uh, internal aid uh, as uh, it were. Now, just before uh, we go, we must also appreciate that uh, apart from the external aid and the internal aid, we also have other aids to interpretation called the linguistic canons of interpretation, also known as the common, uh, uh, common law rules of interpretation. And these aids of interpretation are aids which have been observed from my use of language, how uh, language is used, right? That is why we say that the linguistic canons of interpretation. So they started as linguistic canons. They started as uh, rules of language use, but uh, over time they were recognized by interpreters as some internal aids to interpretation. And they are based upon rules of grammar and language. And that is why I say linguistic. So we, we, we take example, and let's keep some of them in mind for purposes of multiple choice and other things, right? So for example, we have like the, the rule we call the uh, ut res majest valet quam parat. Ut res majest valet quam parat. And that means that uh, a document should be construed in a manner that will save it rather than render it void or illegal. In other words, uh, if you're interpreting a document, you have to be uh, you know, pro upholding the document. That is to say that resist the temptation, which will lead to readily uh, jump to conclusion that the document is void or the document is a nullity. And that if it is possible for you to uh, save the document from being ineffectual, for being uh, void, or for being uh, strike down as illegal, you have to uh, do that. And it is often invoked in those situations where a test learned itself to two meanings. So we have like a two possible meanings. One of the meanings will save the document, while the other meaning will render, uh, uh, will rather, uh, render it uh, void. So uh, in such a case, the court will choose the meaning which will save the document. And, and that is why sometimes the would rest margins valid comparate will be treated as being done uh, saving the document uh, or, or linguistic canon. Uh, somebody has made an annotation. Uh, do you want to say something? Who made annotation? Uh, the big blue line. You want to make a comment? Can put up your hand and then uh, we will allow you. Uh, 
okay. Another uh, linguistic uh, canon is what you call the uh, use them generis rule. Uh, use them generis rule. So you want to keep that in mind for multiple choice purposes. And it's basically to the effect that in constrained statutes and documents, the court should have regard to the general words used, as well as the words of the same class preceding it. And the meaning of the preceding words should be limited by the general words uh, use. So it will usually happen, let's say that where you have like the, you have like listing, right? You have a listing and you've listed the number of words. And the words that you have listed suggest that they are constituting a class, you know, like a, a genus. And at the end of the lesson, you put a general word like and such like and things like that. So the question is, uh, the general word which you have put at the end of the lesson suggests that you have not exhausted the lesson of the members of that class. But how do we determine the other members, the other items, which have not been stated? And that is why the user generis uh, principle says that the general word should be controlled or circumscribed by the preceding uh, 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 words so that it will uh, control the scope you know, the, the scope and you know, how wide that general word can be in terms of what should be added to the list and, and so on. So that is the point. And that is why if you look at the Asari against the Attorney General, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, especially uh, the Professor Kluge in trying to write in uh, this line, which the gentleman put there is unnecessary blocking my view. Uh, can you erase it? Uh, let me see. Okay, so let's say it can. Okay, so in uh, Asari versus the Attorney General, we get an illustration of uh, the use them generous uh, rule uh, at work. And uh, it's quite evident from the opinion of uh, Justice Professor Kluge. The case, as we know very well from your constitutional law, was about the meaning of the phrase uh, in Article 60, Clause 8. And that phrase is that uh, whenever the president is absent from Ghana, right? Whenever the president is absent from Ghana. So if you take your constitution, article uh, 60, uh, plus eight, uh, let me read that. Whenever the president is absent from Ghana or is for any other reason unable to perform the function of his office, the president shall perform the functions of the president until the president returns was able to perform his function. Now, the Justice Kluge expressed the view that uh, the phrase, whenever the president absent from Ghana was construed, use them the nearest with for any other reason, unable to perform the functions of his uh, office. So if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, uh, the lesson, there was an issue as to, uh, what to determine as uh, constituting what the any other will also be treated like the, uh, any other uh, uh, reason. 
uh, as it were. Now, other linguistic uh, canals of interpretation are what we call the expressio uh, unus et exclusio uh, oteros rule. Expressio unus et uh, exclusio oteros rule, which is simply uh, means that the express mention of one shows an intention to exclude the one not mentioned. And that one is not any uh, unique thing, it's quite consistent with our own usage. For example, if there are 10 uh, students and I say that uh, the following are the good students, A, B, C, D. Now, I have mentioned four out of the 10. So the fact that I have left out the other six means that by what I mean by good student, the other six are excluded. And that is why we say that the express mention of a thing implied uh, exclusion of the ones which are not mentioned. So uh, we say that the expressio unus et exclusio oterus. And I mean, I think that is a quite obvious from everyday use of language and it's not very unique to law. Another linguistic uh, expression or linguistic canon is what they call the nocita associates. By the nocita associates uh, rule, uh, we mean that the meaning of a word is known from its associates or the meaning of a word depend on its environment. So like we say that uh, to understand the meaning of a word, you must look at other words which it is associated with. Or we assume that words, if we like, behave like the chameleon. You know how chameleon assumes the color of its environment. And it's the same principle uh, uh, which underpins the Nosita Associates rule that the word is known by its associates or by its. Uh, environment uh, as it were. And uh, finally, just uh, before we wind up, let's touch on what you call the presumptions. Uh, presumptions are uh, legal inferences or assumptions, uh, disclosing that certain facts exist, which are dependent on proving existence of some facts. And when you are doing uh, interpretation, right? When you are doing interpretation, uh, you are entitled to uh, take for granted certain things. And those things you are entitled to take for granted as existing are what we call like the presumptions. So if you took your Black Law uh, Dictionary, for example, right? If we take your uh, Black Law uh, Dictionary, uh, if you have like the ninth edition, page 1304, and you look up like the meaning of presumption, it will just say what I have just uh, quoted for you, that quote, a legal inference or assumption that a fact exists based on known or proven existence of some other fact or group of facts. And then uh, he will say, yeah, so that is uh, uh, what a presumption is. And for purposes of uh, interpretation, uh, certain assumptions are permitted to be made by the person doing interpretation. Yeah, so certain assumptions are allowed to be made. Uh, and so what are uh, some of these uh, uh, presumptions? Uh, but before that, it suffices to note that uh, statutory presumption are of two kinds. We have the rebuttable presumption and then we have the conclusive uh, presumption. Rebuttable presumption means that the assumption which you are allowed to make and which you are making is not final, is not indefeasible. It can be uh, overcome or it can be displaced or that assumption can be demonstrated to be wrong or as not the case. So that is a rebuttable uh, presumption. And then we also have what we call the, uh, 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 the irrebuttable presumption, the conclusive presumption. So for conclusive or irrebuttable presumption, that to say that 
the assumption uh, that you are making is a assumption which cannot be displaced or which is uh, considered as uh, being true under all circumstances. And it is the law which says that it is the law which is making it conclusive and not any other thing. Factually, that may not be, but the law says that that is conclusive. And so, uh, so be it. So let us uh, pay attention to that. Now let's look at the, some uh, examples. If you look at the uh, Evidence Act, right? If you look at the Evidence uh, Act, uh, NRC Decree 323, uh, it defines uh, 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 presumptions. And again, if we look at the Section 20, it tells us the effect of like the presumption as well. Uh, I hope you go and look at your evidence uh, acts in the course of time. Otherwise, I will ask some of you to, to read uh, what the evidence act is saying. But I have my legislation here. And because of time, and you don't have like the luxury of time for this type of engagement, let me just uh, presume to read for you. So if you look at the Evidence Act 1975, NRC Decree 323, Section 18 uh, defines presumption and inference as follows. Quote, subsection one, presumption is assumption of fact that the law requires we made from another fact or group of facts found or otherwise established in an action. So very similar to the Black Law Dictionary. And then uh, the subsection two, we say that a presumption is I, subsection two is that a presumption is either conclusive or rebuttable. And then if we look at the uh, session uh, 20, uh, that a rebuttable presumption imposes upon the party against whom it operates the burden of producing evidence and the burden of persuasion as to non-existence of the presumed uh, fact uh, as uh, it were. So we can classify uh, rebuttable presumption into maybe general purpose presumption, specific, pro uh, specific pro uh, presumption in non statutory documents, and then specific presumption in statutory documents. So let's look at the, some of the specific presumption related to interpretation of statutes. So we have presumption against interference with vested rights. So when you are interpreting the statutes, uh, where people have uh, uh, certain rights uh, which are vested, then you are supposed to actually uh, avoid an interpretation of meaning which will undermine or interfere with that vested right. And again, uh, there's also presumption against unclear changes in the common law. In other words, when you are interpreting, uh, you don't have to assume that the common law has changed. If the common law has changed, the change should be emphatic and it should be quite clear. And that is why we are saying that there's a presumption against unclear changes in the common law. And not only that, there's also a presumption against unclear changes in existing law. You don't have to assume that the existing law has changed unless the change is obvious. The change is clear and unambiguous. So you don't have to think or you don't have to assume a change in the existing law. And again, uh, presumption against retrospective legislation, this is a a presumption which is founded upon the constitution, uh, as you know uh, very well. Okay, so uh, a number of you are familiar with my Ghana legal system and legal method book. Uh, I, I think I don't have a copy here with me, but if you look at the chapter 12 of that uh, book, I think that uh, you could read more about examples of presumptions used in interpretation of the uh, of, of, of a statute uh, as it were. So uh, thank you uh, very much for coming at the short notice. I just take a few questions and then we end this session. So if you want to uh, contribute, you are free to contribute towards the discussion.
up your hand and then we allow you uh, okay uh we have honorable here me it's been a long time niyama sir yeah can i ask a question yes honorable you, you've been missing for quite some time in our previous classes because i was really Oh right. Okay. Come again. You've been you've been missing for quite article one thirty four. All right. Yeah. Article one. Yes. Of the constitution. Yes. Where it says one person of the uh, Supreme Court can rule or can 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 make a decision. What is the meaning? What is for? Article one thirty four of the constitution. One thirty four. Um. Powers of a single dasi of Supreme Court, yes. Yes, yes. Now, what did you say the question is? I'm asking, is it that uh, one person can act in place of, let's say, five branches of the Supreme Court in a certain, in certain cases? All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Honorable Ni Amasa rightly said, after 134, uh, governs the powers of a single justice of the Supreme Court. And his question is that uh, uh, can one justice of the Supreme Court uh, adjudicate a case which is supposed to be handled by the minimum number of five? Uh, the answer is uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, because when there's a matter before Supreme Court, we have various interlocutory application, right? Various interlocutory application, when we say interlocutory application, applications which are not germane to determination of the issues in controversy, determination of the case, but uh, meant to actually drive the litigation forward towards the stage where the case can be heard on its merits and decided by the panel. So maybe, for example, a person is supposed to file a written submission or he wants to make amendment to his written statement of case and all that. You need to get a leave. You need to get a permission of the of the court, and so on. Now that one can be heard by a single justice, but the case itself cannot be heard by a single justice. That will have to be heard by the proper panel, either the minimum of five or seven or whatever panel the Supreme Court to put there. But the minimum should be five. That is the ordinary panel. So the single justice uh, of the Supreme Court power uh, relates to uh, applications, right? Applications and not the actual uh, uh, merits of the case as it were. Okay. Uh, Honorable, I don't know if that uh, helps. Uh, then we have uh, Saleh, Abina, Debra, Saleh. Yes, Sally, you can go ahead. Good evening, please. Good evening. Doc, please, uh, my question is, under what situation or instances will the purposive rule as established by Lord Denning in the case of Mago and St. Melons versus the new port be applicable in the Ghanaian context? Right. The purposive rule of interpretation, and that is why I've asked you to go and read the the, the, uh, the chapter 12 and 13 of our, our, uh, our textbook. The purposive rule of interpretation, as you say, is the, the most current uh, approach towards interpretation. And uh, that rule uh, is that anytime you are doing uh, interpretation, the interpretation should seek to advance the purpose for which the lawmaker made the law. 
And of course, that is why some uh, jurists or some critics of, uh, hold the view that the purposive rule of interpretation actually allow judges more or less to become, uh, to do what you call the judicial legislation or lawmaking because uh, judges will try and determine the purpose. And once they have determined the purpose of the particular legislation, then they will be at liberty to come out with interpretation or meaning, which is consistent with the purpose uh, of the legislation, uh, which they have determined. And of course, the chief proponent of the purposive interpretation in terms like the jurists, if you look at the Aaron Barak, that uh, the Israeli uh, uh, jurist, uh, he advances. And then, of course, you look at our, our Supreme Court, and also the interpretation uh, act itself is giving a primatu or blessing to the purposive uh, interpretation. And so that is the paradigm. But the three rules we told you about, I want to call like the the basic uh, rules of like the uh, interpretation as crystallized at common law. Yeah, Abdullah. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Doc. Pleasure. Then, uh, Bex. Uh, Bex, is Bex hand up or by mistake? Yes, please. Doc, good evening. Good evening, Bex. Um, please, I wanted to be clear on um, the golden rule. I don't know if uh, my understanding is correct. Okay. If I'm getting it, it's like the golden rule, um, there are two main schools of thought. One of them is that where the plain or ordinary meaning will lead to absurdity, you must depart from that plain meaning. And then the second one is that even if it will lead to absurdity, you must apply it like that. Is that the case? No. The, uh, it means uh, what you, you told us. And in fact, uh, I would like to quote, right? I have the black uh, law dictionary before me again. I like to quote and then I will comment on Burke's golden rule, Black's law dictionary page 761 quote. The principle that in construing written instruments, a court should adhere to the grammatical and ordinary sense of the words, unless that adherence will lead to some manifest absurdity, especially in statutory construction. The principle that if a status literal meaning will lead to an absurd or unjust result, or even to an inconsistency within the statute itself, the statute should be interpreted in a way that avoids such a result or inconsistency. Uh, yeah, so uh, the golden rule, as uh, we said, builds upon the literal or the plain meaning rule. The plain meaning rule says that we should give the ordinary or the grammatical meaning to the West, right? Mm -hmm. But where the ordinary or the grammatical meaning of the word, or for example, let you get a result which is so upset, which is so repugnant that uh, parliament could not have been contemplated to have actually intended uh, such a meaning, then you need to uh, avoid or you need to modify the plain meaning or the ordinary meaning so as to avoid the upset or the unreasonable uh, or the repugnant uh, results. Yeah, so uh, Bex, uh, I think that is what the position is. Okay, so we'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, thank you for coming. And at uh, 9.30, uh, when I get home, I would like to do some land law uh, with you. 9.30, not 9 p.m., all right. so. Thank you very much. Have uh, a good evening, not good night here because some of you meet again at 9.30. Okay. <laughs>